Good morning, beloved. I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A few years ago, my wife Priscilla and I decided to visit a few countries in Europe. We landed in Heath London's Heathrow Airport. We took a ship to Holland a few days later. And from Germany, we traveled by train to Italy. However, when evening came and it was time to sleep on the train, I got a little worried. I wondered, will I wake up in Italy? Or would the coach we were on not accidentally be unhooked at the borders of Austria or some other country? Suddenly, I was no longer so sure if the train would reach Rome. Will we reach our destination? Was the question in my mind. Brothers and sisters, we are on a train, on our way. But will the train reach its destination, heaven? What will happen to God's church? This is the question that should be of utmost importance to every Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Just as I wanted to know if the train would reach its destination, so we need to discover the final destiny of God's church. Will it endure to the end? Will God's faithful few need to leave the church in the last days? Or will the faithful few stay in the church? while everyone else leaves. It is important to know how God is going to deal with His church in the last days. We need to understand what is meant by the phrase, the shaking. Will God's believers, His true believers, be shaken out? Or will the unfaithful be shaken out? We need to know. And this brings us to the title of this morning's message. Shaken out or sealed? We will try to answer each of the questions we have just raised. But more than that, we will learn together how to face the future with a firm hope of assurance in Jesus. Now, throughout history, God's church has been subjected to crises. God's people have often drifted into apostasy. Sometimes they adopted the customs and practices of the people around them. And this is especially true of the Old Testament church. For example, God called Abraham out from among the idolaters of his day. And as a friend of God, Abraham was especially called out because of his obedience. Later, God called the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage to maintain this obedient relationship with him. When Israel persisted in disobedience, God often allowed them to go into captivity and face persecution in order to teach them the dependence upon him. But in spite of the warnings of the prophets, continued loving pleas to repent and the pain of persecution, Israel blatantly continued in rebellion. So God called out of Judaism a faithful remnant who willingly served him. When we come to the New Testament, it's interesting to note that the Greek word for church is ecclesia, where ek means out and klesia means call. So the New Testament church was a body of believers called out of Judaism to maintain faithful allegiance to God. As we look at church history, we see that the New Testament church drifted away from God. Pagan practices began to slip into the church. Images, Sunday worship, human ordinances, all these were signs of the the growing apostasy. The Reformation was a great calling out of God's people. God called reformers out of the Catholic Church. 
then those reformers, Luther, Wycliffe, Haas, Jerome, Calvin and others, called out the true believers from the church. But then, as the Protestant churches failed to keep pace with the advancing light of God's word, God again called Bible students out of pro Protestantism during the Advent movement in the 1800s. Whenever the church has drifted away from God, has adopted the principles and practices of the world, has not kept pace with the advancing light, has compromised the principles of scripture, God has called out a body of believers. Now there are many Seventh-day Adventists today who are concerned as they see certain conditions within the church. They wonder whether God is again going to call out a body of believers from the Seventh-day Adventist church in order to purify it. In fact, there are movements we often refer to as offshoots which have their entire philosophy based on the idea that God is going to purify the church by calling out a faithful few. In the past, God's method of purifying the church has been to call out a separate, distinct body of believers. But in the last days, God uses a different method. This time, he purifies the church by shaking out the unfaithful. Those who are loyal to the principles of God's word and the teachings of Jesus remain. We call them the remnant. Isaiah used a farming illustration to describe the same concept when he said in Isaiah 41 verse 16, You will winnow them and the wind shall carry them away. John the Baptist echoed that same symbol when he said in Matthew 3 verse 12, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The farmer finds his wheat and the chaff are all mixed together. How can they be separated? Well, the farmer takes the wheat and the chaff and throws it all up into the air. The chaff being lighter is blown away in the wind. The wheat remains. Ellen White says in the book Selected Messages, volume 2 and page 380, I'm quoting, The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains. While the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal. But nevertheless, it must take place. Clearly, God's method of purifying the church today is not to call out a small group who are faithful. On the contrary, he will shake out the unfaithful. The church will not fall. It will triumph. And this leads us to some basic, some fundamental questions. Who will be shaken out when the crisis comes? What groups of people will be shaken or sifted out? How can you and I be sure we are among those who remain? Let's take a look at four groups of people that have been identified as those who will be shaken out. Number one, we have the worldly. Let's begin with 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The God, small g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Spirit of Prophecy, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 81. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment and death. In this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. 
There is a lot of beauty in this world, isn't it? But there is also much that leads us away from a meaningful relationship with Jesus. Yet haven't you found that when you look into the face of Jesus, when his matchless love has captivated your heart, the things of this earth, in the words of the old hymn, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I like the way the Phillips Modern English Bible puts Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. It says, With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze, squeeze you, pardon me, squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good. And today, it's very easy for the minds of even God's people to become so captivated with sports stars, TV stars, pop stars, and Hollywood stars that they have little room for Jesus in their thinking. They are so occupied with the things of this world, enthralled with the pleasures of this life, that there's no room for Jesus. The minds of the worldly are just too filled with other things to give Jesus priority. They try to copy the world instead of copying Jesus. The second group that will be shaken out is the superficial. Paul in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5 describes these people as holding the form of religion but denying the power of it. They are also discussed in the Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 463. The superficial conservative class, whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work, will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies, toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. The superficial conservative class. Who is this class? Well, they are quite different from the worldly. They are alarmed at the trends in the church. You won't find them sitting in front of the television for five or six hours per day. You won't see them going to worldly places of entertainment. But they are only superficially conservative. One pastor described them as the status quo Christians. You know, the sort who, who say everything is all right. Don't worry, we are on target. By all means, be committed. Return God's tithe and go to Sabbath school and church. But don't be too zealous. Don't go too far. We are going to make it all right. And the church is going to get through the crisis. Their prayers lack personal passion. They study the Bible only occasionally. And they think it is boring. The Great Controversy puts it this way, page 6 to 5. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. That doesn't sound like superficial Christianity, does it? The third group is the self-confident. This group is not like those who are worldly nor superficial. Paul has some very direct counsel for those in this group who are, as he puts it, swollen with conceit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Ellen White adds a similar thought from Testimonies for the Church, volume 6 and page 400, where she says, Those who have had great light and precious privileges, but have not improved them, will, under one pretext or another, go out from us. These are the people who are standing still, who are stagnant, relying on their present experience, not taking their opportunities to grow in Christ. They are like Peter saying to Jesus, Lord, though all men forsake you, I'll go with you through the fire all the way to death. 
You don't have to worry about me, Lord. I'm confident that when the crisis breaks, when the trial comes, I'll defend you. When Calvary comes, Lord, I'll be there by your side. In fact, I've already got my sword ready. You know, when Peter took out his sword, he wasn't aiming at Malchus's ear. He was ready to fight. He was filled with self-confidence. But the problem was that Peter needed more than human strength to face the crisis. There are many today who are not in the worldly group, nor in the superficial conservative class. They may even be spending great amounts of time with God in Bible study and prayer. But the basis of their religious experience is themselves. They believe that no matter what, they certainly would not give up their faith. But unfortunately, any individual who puts confidence in his own ability to stand firm rather than in Jesus is like the man in Jesus' parable who built his house on the sand rather on the rock. Rather than on the rock. When the crisis comes, their self-centered experience will collapse. How important it is for us to learn daily dependence we need to kneel down each morning to admit, Dear God, I know that by myself I'm unable to cope with Satan's temptations. I know I need you, God. Dear God, I know that on my own I do not have power enough for the day. Jesus wants to lead you and me to be less confident in what we can do and more confident in what he can do, and have less confidence in our power and more in his. Righteousness by faith in a practical experience means that every day I totally trust Jesus to live in me through his spirit, enabling me to cope with the temptations of Satan. Each day I must deliberately place my confidence in Christ, both for the pardon of my sins and for power to live for him. Those in the final group lead lives that revolve around self. We call them the lovers of self. They are not willing to make sacrifices for God and his work. There is an interesting commentary on this group found in Early Writings, page 50. It says, the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on, and all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. How much of the church will these four classes represent? Here's what Ellen White says, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 136. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsakes us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. So a great proportion will not remain the majority will forsake God's church. One thing that may be hard to believe today, but which we know will happen is this. Those who leave God's church in the last days will become the bitterest opponents of God's true believers. They will eagerly witness against those who remain faithful in the courts of law. There are four agencies that are going to cause the shaking. Let's look at each of these. The first agency is that of false doctrines or heresy. God will allow heresy to enter the church. Many will accept these false teachings and be shaken out as a result. Listen to these specific words of scripture. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. The Spirit says expressly that in after times some will desert from the faith and give their minds to subversive doctrines inspired by devils. Ellen White adds this fitting metaphor 
in Testimonies to Ministers, page 112. When the shaking comes, by the introduction of false theories, these surface readers anchored nowhere are like shifting sand. Heresy then play a part in purifying God's church. Secondly, some will leave the church on the basis of miracles. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 53. Satan will make people sick and then will suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Those who are looking for the spectacular and who look for miracles more than the truth will accept this counterfeit. Thirdly, persecution will shake a great number out of the church. In the Great Controversy, Ellen White shares this insight Page 608, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. When persecution really breaks, those superficial Adventists who look for praise, flattery and popularity will leave. Fourthly, the final cause of the shaking is revealed in early writings, page 270. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Who is this true witness to the Laodiceans? It is Jesus. And what is his counsel to the Laodiceans? Found in Revelation 3 verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. The gold is a faith that works by love. So Jesus is saying, I counsel with you to have a living faith. Faith is a relationship with God as with a friend well known. It leads us to do whatever he asks because we trust him and we know he desires our best good. What else does Jesus counsel his people to buy? Yes, the white raiment. What does white raiment represent? Jesus' righteousness. But is Jesus' righteousness a cloak to cover the sins that I am presently committing and to enable me to continue to commit them and not feel guilty? Of course not. Or is the righteousness of Christ provision made for every sinful act that I have committed in the past, a provision made for my sinful nature and provision made to break the power of sin in my life right now? That's what it is, isn't it? The white raiment covers and cleanses. It represents the dying lamb and the living priest. Sin's penalty broken and sin's power broken too. So the character offered to the Laodicean church, the last day church, is an experience of victory. When Jesus offers to anoint our eyes with eye salve, the eye salve represents the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit so that we begin to see our real need. We experience a conviction of sin that drives us to Jesus. And within our church, there's going to be that type of revival, a revival of living faith with men and women obtaining the victory of a new and fresh experience with Jesus. As people's minds are opened up by the Holy Spirit, they'll sense the nearness of Jesus' soon coming, and that will produce a shaking within the church. In earth's last hours, when the mark of the beast is enforced, the worldly, 
the superficial, the self-confident Laodiceans and the lovers of self will leave us. Many of these may be in the church now, but they will be finally shaken out then. Only two groups, the saved and the lost, will remain. It is in this time of shaking that God will purify His church. As one class is shaken out, another will be sealed. Satan will introduce doctrinal heresies into the church. In addition, he'll work false miracles. Thousands of superficial, lukewarm, Laodicean Seventh-day Adventists will be deceived. But God will have a group of people who know what it means to daily walk with Jesus. They will be settled into the truth and they will be sealed. Now what is the seal and how can we receive it? There will be an ever-increasing number of false revivals and false manifestations of Satan's power. But on the other hand, God pours out his power in the latter rain. He prepares hearts through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to his people. And while the Bible assures us that the crisis is coming, it also promises God's mark of protection known as the seal of God, which will enable us to pass through the crisis. The book of Revelation speaks about two marks, the mark of the beast and the seal of God. The mark of the beast is visibly manifest in worshipping the beast, in accepting the authority of the beast rather than divine authority. Those who receive the mark of the beast will be caught up in the false revival. They will enforce the mark in an attempt to bribe and force, imprison and ultimately pass the death decree upon those who don't receive the mark. But God will have a people who will receive his seal rather than the mark of the beast. These people are not shaken out. They cannot be bribed. They don't fear imprisonment or the threat of economic sanctions, even the threat of death cannot cause them to be disloyal to God. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1 we read, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. In the Bible, Wind often refers to destruction or persecution, and that's exactly what it means here. God's angels are restraining Satan, holding him back from creating total disaster. Today we sometimes see those winds blowing in gentle gusts, but God is warning us. He's warning us here about a storm that is coming, relentless in its fury. Then I saw another angel ascending out of the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who had the power to harm the earth and the sea. Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God upon their foreheads. Notice, beloved, that the seal of God is received in the forehead. Do you remember that the mark of the beast will be received in one of two places? What are they again? The forehead or the hand. Now what's the difference between the two? And why is the seal only received in the forehead? The word forehead here does not refer to just the external skull. Rather, it is a reference to the brain, the mind. This is not something that is uh, branded on men and women like a brand placed upon cattle. The word means the place of conscience, reason and judgment. The mark of the beast is recorded either in the mind or on the hand. Men and women will either intellectually be convinced to accept the falsehoods and lies of the beast's power, or they will be forced to conform. Satan will use the powers of reason to confuse people to reject the truth and accept a lie, or if he cannot intellectually convince them, he will use force, 
forcing them to serve him. But Jesus does not force. He simply and lovingly appeals to the mind. So the seal of God is not received in the hand because Jesus does not force. Every person who ultimately receives God's seal has voluntarily chosen to open his mind to God. If any Seventh-day Adventist audience were asked, what is the seal of God? The general answer that would probably be given would be this. The seal of God is the Sabbath. That, of course, is correct, but we need to qualify it. The first thing to notice about the seal of God is that the sealing work is a process in the life of the believer. It is not an act. This sealing process begins at conversion and ends when the believer makes a final decision for or against truth at the time of the National Sunday Law. There are some today who look at the seal of God and think it is the Sabbath alone. Their idea is that the seal of God is something that is stamped on the believer in an instant when the National Sunday Law is passed. They think of receiving the seal as an instantaneous act. They don't realize that the sealing work is a process. Receiving the seal of God depends upon our daily responses to the daily appeals of the Holy Spirit. Look at this reference from the book Early Writings, page 43. Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver. Have you been looking forward to the future to be sealed? We cannot afford to wait, friends. This is the sealing time right now. In the light of this process, what exactly is the seal? Now, one of the clearest reference in the spirit of prophecy regarding a definition of the seal is found in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161. It says, Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Notice that this passage defines the seal as a settling into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that one cannot be moved. Do you see then why the sealing process is going on right now? We are being settled into the truth of God, both spiritually and intellectually. Something is happening in the mind of every child of God right now. It is a sealing process so that at the test, when the National Sunday Law is passed, men and women, by their daily choices now, will already be settled into the truth. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were asked to bow down, they already knew their answer. They did not have to decide then. They had made a decision long ago. Take myself as an example. If someone should offer me a strong drink or a smoke, I don't have to think or decide then whether I will take it or not. I have made my decision 35 years ago. No more drink, no more smoke for me. The Sabbath, beloved, is an outward manifestation of that inward settling. It's a revelation of an inner experience with Jesus in which I have learned to rest in Him, to trust in Him, to totally and completely rely upon Him. So then, because in a thousand choices day by day, we have learned to trust Jesus. In a thousand choices day by day, we have learned to rely upon Jesus. In a thousand choices day by day, we have learned to depend upon Jesus. When the Sunday law is passed, it will be natural for me to continue keeping His Sabbath as a demonstration of that trust experience. I would like you to notice 
In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, the significance of the sealing process that is going on now. If you would like some meaningful spiritual meat for your personal devotions, take this book and read the chapter entitled The Seal of God. You'll find it to be marvelously, marvelously clear and to the point on the subject of the sealing. Let me just quote one passage right now from page 216. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. We have today cameras that take photographs of distant galaxies. In these cameras, the shutter is opened and exposed to the light of the distant galaxy, not for split seconds or even for hours or days, but for weeks, months, and even years. And as this shutter on the camera is opened and the film is exposed to the light of the distant galaxy, the light shining from the distant galaxy is built up on the photographic plate until, after days, weeks, months, and years, the film has taken the image and the seal, if you please, of the distant galaxy. The mind of the Christian, day by day, viewing Jesus through scripture and prayer, is also a phot photographic plate. The mind of Jesus becomes the mind of the believer. The will of Jesus becomes the will of the believer. Day by day, the believer's mind is shaped and molded and sealed. And the believer's life, through the impressions of the Holy Spirit, grows to reflect the image of Jesus. And thus the believer is sealed. It's written in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 this way. But all of us who are Christians have no veils on our faces, but reflect like mirrors the glory of our Lord. We are transfigured in ever-increasing splendor into His own image, and the transformation comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As we behold Jesus and his matchless love, as we behold the will of God revealed in his word, the Holy Spirit takes the law of God and writes it in our hearts. Thus all the powers of hell cannot force God's people to disobey him. All human laws, bribes, imprisonment, Economic boycotts and the threats of death cannot force God's people to give up their allegiance or loyalty. The truth has been indelibly imprinted upon their hearts. How about you? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to do that writing in your heart, in your mind, day by day? Are you opening your mind each day to that process so that you can see Jesus and his principles in the Bible and allow Jesus to mold and shape your mind? Is the truth of God and the life of God and the love of God being sealed in your mind? The sealing is a process in which an individual Christian draws near to the Savior day by day. Paul's wish, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, becomes a reality in his experience. The experience spoken of in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, becomes real. And when the final test of loyalty to God is brought on the stage of this world, the committed Christian responds with obedience and allows the Holy Spirit to solidify his faith and see them through the end-time events. There are many people today who look 
with great fear to the future. They are terrified as they consider the coming time of trouble. But God has not called us to such fear.